there's something that I've always been attached to, and it, I don't know what it is. I've only lived in Brooklyn. I've never lived in Manhattan, for example. There's something that feels like home. I enjoy going to like the bodega and hearing the music there, or like going to other parts of, of Brooklyn, hearing like dance hall stuff like that. I mean, the fact that there is a lot of other cultures that I'm not around all the time, I find that pretty exciting. Uh, my name is Jacques Renault, and I am one half of Runaway here in Brooklyn. I'm Marcos Cabral. Uh, I do Runaway with Jacques. I moved to, to the city in uh, the mid-90s. I worked for Syntax, which was a record distributor. I was also at Satellite and Sonic Groove as well. I put in a lot of time in like record shops. I grew up uh, playing classical music and then jazz. And then I discovered dance music, I'd say, in like 96, 97. And moved to New York in 2002, where I was just doing disco the whole time. I feel like the sway, the general sway in like the music at that time was very exciting. Yeah. I yeah. think we were going out a lot, you know, yeah. like we were partying a lot and like the music was coming out of us hanging out a lot. Yeah. I think we were just getting excited. We were just about amped it. up, yeah. yeah. We wanted to make something that was like super yeah. amped up. We started off doing edits, chopping stuff up and like becoming familiar with each other. Somehow that morphed into uh, working on music with drum machines and synths. So Marcus and I have uh, On The Prowl Records together here in Brooklyn, and I also do Let's Play House Records. Oh, here we did, here's a full sleeve we did for On The Prowl. Yeah. And this was, uh, it was a remix EP from um, The Revenge and Azari and the Third. Uh, mm -hmm. It was one of our biggest singles on, on mm -hmm. The Prowl, so we felt they were mm -hmm. entitled to have a full sleeve. Yeah. <laughs> this was our custom sleeve for On The Prowl. I still appreciate going to the record shop and just exploring anything, and I still find something that's an inspiration. Yeah. There is still this fantasy with record shops in New mm -hmm. York. I think that's kind of, it's not even a fantasy, it's reality. It's yeah. like you can find stuff that you can't find anywhere else in the world. Yeah. The thing is, uh, we sell bric-a-brac clothing furniture, books, and records. Um, I found the place probably in about 2000 or 2001. I don't know what year it was. And I came here and I had like never left. I was just here every day. I had time off, I would come here. And then eventually they gave me a job. Somehow I got lucky and I just do records. So like if new records come in, I go through them and take out all the mold and the garbage and then put them in crates and bring them in the back. I mean, in New York, uh, there's still a lot of uh, old records floating around that are easy to obtain for three bucks, you know? You can go to some of these record shops and there's tons of catalog for you to explore. I mean, of course, there's the internet to look at it. But here, it's like, it's at the record shop. You can go and check it out. And I think that, that plays a big part of it. This place is definitely my biggest influence, like, uh, because it's like a, the bottom of the barrel, the worst records that nobody wants. You know, when I first came, it was I mean, it was like 2000, 2001, no one really wanted Italo Records or House, you know, or like tracks. You know, you'd come to a section and be like, all red label tracks records. And that was like, wow, you know, you'd buy, get all the Italo Records with the red stamp from 1983, like didn't even listen to them. And now, none of that stuff is here anymore because everybody wants a, like House, 80s House, disco classics. But now it's like the worst records are like the 90s ones. So that's what I'm getting into now because nobody wants them. So I'm getting these like early 90s like trance records and late new beat and just bad rave records. I've always gotten the cheapest records I could get because I'm cheap and I can get more, you know. I'm not the guy that goes and buys the $20 reissue. So this is, you know, best record store in the world. My name is William Thomas Burnett. I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas and uh, I've lived in New York since 1999 in Brooklyn. I have a record label called WT Records. I also make music. The first record I did was called Smackulator and that was a project with Lego Welp. It was like we were really into Dance Mania so we made a ghetto house record. After that I did like some remixes as Speculator which is my DJ name. I had a project called Grackle which was on Strange Life Records from Holland. With this guy, Elliot, we did Galaxy Tubin, which is like a prog rock, like 
Tangerine Dream thing. And then I started Willie Burns. Trying to do house music, but it's kind of retarded, so it's like not quite dance music. Now I have a new project called Black Deer, which is like 12 string acoustic guitar with effects. Well, originally the idea was I want to have a record label that's a functional DJ record, like a DJ would buy the record and take it to a club or a party and play the record, you know? It doesn't necessarily have to be dance music, but it would be like a functional record that a DJ would play on a radio show or, you know, like a nice object. If somebody wants to put out your music, it legitimizes your music. If someone else is like, hey, I'm going to put out your record with my money from my wallet, you know, like, cool, you know. You like have a relationship with a person and you get the music, get it mastered, send it to the pressing plant, find out how to get money to pay for it, try to get your money back, and then do it again, you know. I think other people's music is better. I'd rather spend my money on that, you know. Sean O'Sullivan, he knows everything about everything. He's a very, very smart guy. He finally started making music in like 2006. He just slowly started buying more and more and more gear and borrowing gear and then he finally just, he could just do it. He's like one of those people that can just make music. Uh, well, Sean, I had known probably since 2002 or 2003, he was just on the same internet forums and then you just kind of like, oh, you live in New York and then you're at the same party and like, Maybe there was MySpace by then, so you could like stalk them a little bit and know what they look like. There's donuts. <coughs> donuts? That's pretty cool. People are happy that New York is making dance music at all again. It's been kind of a while since New York was really on the map for anything other than bad indie rock. New York's bad in all the obvious ways. It's expensive, it's dirty, it's exhausting. It's, it's hard to get around. Gentrification is increasingly, you know, approaching a light speed. It's, it's worrisome because it, it bodes poorly for New York in a lot of ways. If you want to be here, you're here for a reason because it sucks in a lot of ways. So you got to want to be here. I'm Sean O'Sullivan. I make music under my own name. Did a record for Lies under the name Vapatine. I do stuff with my girlfriend under the name Further Reductions, and uh, I'm in a band called Letter Est. I've been DJing since I was 16, 17. I grew up in the Midwest playing hard acid, like drop bass network, 160, 180 BPM, along with some gabber and experimental hardcore and uh, drum and bass uh, tech step stuff and some breakcore stuff. So that's really kind of my teen angst, soul food kind of music for me. And yeah, I, I like to channel some of that into what I do. I think techno and dance music should have the spirit of, of rave, you know, it should be get you pumped up music, get you on the dance floor music. So that's what I like, I like striking that balance between the, the dark, the cerebral, but also the, uh, the, the energetic. I like to do everything live in one take. Once you open the floodgates to go back and tinker with things, you give yourself uh, too much liberty. Uh, with electronic music, it's very easy to, to let that take over. You can you can go in and spend hours, you know, obsessing over the placement of one snare, or you can do that if you want to, and it's very easy and it's very powerful. You know, you can make everything sound just the way you want it, but then you also lose the spontaneity and the um, you lose the moment. Well, I mean, I think in Brooklyn, the exciting things at the moment are a lot of the live techno that's coming out. It's unrefined, and it's guys making it at home through a mixing board. And they're not like multi-tracking so much and like fine-tuning it with automation in Ableton. It's more of like a, a live take. I think the rawness and the aggression appeals to people who dance music might not normally appeal to. New York, I think, has an energy that it hasn't had in a couple years. There's, once again, a space for kind of underground, small-scale, intimate dance music to, to exist, uh, where people can take risks and where people are open to hearing music that is, uh, is a little bit daring, but is also functional music, it's dance music. It's built around, you know, stimulating a community and uh, bringing people together and having people 
you know, have a good time. We, we have a lot more at our disposal since the internet became what it is. That is one of the things that has compelled a lot of people in New York to start putting out music is because the, the, the challenge of, of historical activation has diminished. The relevant thing is to, is to contribute to history now, um, as opposed to kind of, you know, mining it. <laughs>